Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and we are going to be covering Le Chatelier, his principle today. Um, basically what this says in short form is that if a system is already at dynamic equilibrium, so let's say that we had just the basic system here that we've covered and that your book covers where you just have the capital letters as the reactants and products. The lowercase letters are just simply talking about the coefficients of each of those reactants and pro products. We're assuming that the system is already at equilibrium. And if it is already at equilibrium, then what we can say is that if the system is perturbed in some way or disrupted in some way, then the entire system is going to compensate for that. And what it's going to do is it's going to shift to compensate for that. And so we talk about, in Le Chatelier's principle, a lot of shifts. It shifts to the left, it shifts to the right, it shifts to products, it shifts to reactants, basically saying similar things. And what we can think about here is we can think about creating kind of a well or a hole or creating a hill. And basically what the system is going to do is it's going to work to flatten that. It's either going to try and fill in the hole or it's going to try and flatten out the hill. Right, so it's going to try and make that happen in some way, shape, or form. And the way it's going to do that is if you have created a hill on one side, it's going to move to the opposite side to make that hill go flat or become flat. And if it has a hill, I mean, if it has a hill, sorry, we just said a hill. If, we, if it has a hole, then it's going to work to go towards the same side the hole is on so that it can fill in that hole. Let's give you an example so that it makes a little bit more better sense here. Let's give several examples for this lovely equilibrium we got going here. And then we'll talk about what it looks like in terms of a real example, all right? So let's say that we had several different things that we could do to the system. And that is almost always true in a Le Chatelier question. You have all kinds of things. We could, let's say, add in, add, a. Okay, so I added more reactant. Okay, what does that do? We could um, subtract out, subtract out A. So somehow, by when we talk about subtracting out, what we almost always are doing is a side reaction, right? Usually this is a side reaction in which a is taken out through some way, shape, or form. Okay, so that's kind of the sense of what's going on there. Or we could add something like heat. The adding heat piece requires us to think about whether this reaction is, it's different depending on if you have an endothermic or exothermic reaction. And that's actually important to know because you got to know what that is first. And then if these all happen to be gases or if you have gases as part of your reactants and products, then we can certainly talk about volume and pressure considerations. All right, so let's do the pro pressure and volume considerations once we have a real reaction up here. Let's just start with this. Okay, so let's say that we add in A. If we add in A, adding in A or adding in B or C or D or whatever the reactant or product is, is the quintessential way of talking about making a hill. Right, so you've just made a hill. Okay, this reaction is, and this is assuming that the reaction is already at equilibrium, right? The only way that Le Chatelier works is if the reaction is already at equilibrium, then you do something to it. Okay, so adding an A is the quintessential hill. How is this reaction going to shift in order to get that hill in a more flat kind of way? What it's going to do is it's going to shift to flit, flatten it out, which means it's going to shift to the opposite side, which is the products. So the shift here, shift towards products, or sometimes instead of saying shifting towards products, which is my ideal way of talking about this, it might just say it shifts right. 
right? Reaction shifts right. And that's fine. You can totally do that. That's fine. OK? So adding an A creates a hill. We want to flatten out that hill. The only way to do that is to spread it across the reaction, which means it's going to shift towards the products. Subtracting out A, all right, well, if adding in A is the quintessential way of making a hill, right, then subtracting it out must be the quintessential way of making a hole, right? And how is this reaction going to shift? Well, it wants to shift in a way that it fills in the hole. So it's going to shift towards the hole to fill it in, which means it's going to shift towards reactants. Okay, maybe we'll put this in a moment here. So for number two, the, what we would say here is it shifts towards the side where the hole is. So since A, we're talking about A, A is a reactant, it's going to shift towards reactants. Or sometimes you will see that it just says shifts left. Okay. It's an interesting thought, right? So kind of the hole versus the hill works a lot of the time. Okay. All right, that was B. Life is great. So if it's a hill, it flattens it out by shifting to the opposite side. If it's a hole, it shifts towards that particular hole in order to fill it in. All right, adding heat. Very important here whether you have an exothermic or endothermic reaction. And what the exo versus endo tells you is where heat is to begin with. All right, so if it's an endothermic reaction, that means that heat is required to really do anything with that reaction. Now, as we'll learn in thermodynamics, heat is not the only consideration we have when we're talking about a reaction. You can have an endothermic reaction and it can still be spontaneous, and that means it still happens. Um, but at the moment, where we are is we have not talked about thermodynamics, we haven't considered Gibbs free energy, and we haven't considered entropy. So what we're kind of saying here is that if it's an endothermic reaction, considering all else being kind of the same, we kind of need heat to make that happen. All right, having said that, if it requires heat to make it happen, then that means that heat is another reactant. So I would add heat to the reactant side, okay? If it was an exothermic reaction, that means heat is released from that reaction. And if heat is released from that reaction, then that means that it would be like another product and you would put heat on the product side, okay? If I have an endothermic reaction, we're gonna go with the endo piece since I already wrote heat as a reactant, and I add heat, as soon as you've labeled this, adding heat is just like adding another reactant. There it is. You've just created a hill on that side. And so how is the reaction going to shift? To eliminate the hill. So it's going to shift to the opposite side, which means it's going to shift right again. It's going to shift towards the products. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. All right, having said all of that, let's do a specific re uh, example that sounds a little more chemistry-ish, all right? So that you can feel like things are happening in a way that you might see in the book. All right, let's take a, a pretty basic example. Let's take something like 2SO2 as a gas plus oxygen as a gas makes 2SO3 as a gas. All right, is that balanced? Looks pretty balanced to me. Okay, this is a very 
straightforward kind of regular reaction. This is one of the ones we see on a regular basis. All right, so let's say that you're going to add SO3, you know, and the idea here is that the instructions are always the same for Le Chatelier problems. They give you a reaction. They say this reaction is already at equilibrium, and then they say something to the effect of if this reaction undergoes the following disruptions, how will it shift? All right, so I add SO3. Sometimes they call it perturbations. That's just disruptions and perturbations are basically the same thing. All right, um, and if we remove O2, if the reaction, if reaction is exothermic, Which way does the reaction shift? Which way does the reaction shift? If you increase the temperature, if temperature temp is increased. Ooh, and I think I'm gonna run out of room. Yeah, no I didn't. All right, great. And then let's do one that is indicative of volume or pressure. Let's say we decrease the volume. All right, put dots after all of these <laughs> so that we actually have periods. All right, so what are we doing here? We're just thinking about which way will this reaction shift based on these kinds of disruptions. Okay, assuming that this reaction is already at equilibrium, notice that I already have something that's wrong with it. Ooh, I put a single-headed arrow. I sure shouldn't have. This reaction is at equilibrium. That means you should have an equilibrium arrow. I am sorry. <laughs> okay, now that we have it right, and it's at equilibrium, then let's add some SO3. Okay, so if we add some SO3, then you're asking yourself, am I creating a hill or a hole? If it's add, then that's a hill, and I have to figure out which side that hill is on. If I'm adding SO3, that is a product. I'm creating the hill over here, which means then my reaction is going to shift to the opposite side to flatten out that hill. So in this case, well, you can't see the difference between yellow and orange, can you? Well, I thought I was doing something cool here. All right, so which way is this reaction going to shift? It's going to shift towards the opposite side, which would be indeed the, pro uh, the reactants. So shifts towards reactants. which means that it essentially shifts left, right? Shifts to the left, excellent. If you remove O2, removing is a quintessential way of talking about making a hole. If I make the hole, I have to figure out where the hole is made, right? And the hole, in this case, is made where the O2 is. I removed some of that, I siphoned it off, or I did, had some side reaction that ha made this occur. And so if I remove the O2, I'm creating a hole. Where's that hole? Well, how is the reaction gonna shift to deal with that hole? It's gonna shift towards the hole, right? It's the whole point. It's gonna shift towards the hole, so it shifts. In this case, it's gonna sh shift towards reactants again. Squeaky marker. Fabulous. If the reaction is exothermic, let's erase my little hole here because I can. If the reaction is exothermic, sorry, it looks like I have paw prints on here, then which way does the reaction shift if the temperature is increased? Okay, if it's exothermic, first we have to figure out where to put heat. If it is exothermic, exothermic means heat out. Okay, exo literally means out, therm means heat. So where am I gonna put the heat in this case? I'm gonna put it on the product side because it's coming off as if it's another product. So when I increase the temperature, increasing the temperature, even though temperature and heat are different 
entities. That's why they're named different things. Temperature is very much related to heat. And so, and there's a direct proportionality, at, le at the very least, between them. So if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the heat in that reaction. And you can basically see that increasing is kind of like adding. It's going to create a hill. Which way is it going to create a hill? It's going to create a hill on the side where heat is. So it creates a hill on this side. How is the reaction going to go in order to compensate for that hill? It's going to flatten it out and go to the opposite side. So every single one of these has been shifts left or shifts towards the reactants. That's pretty cool. All right, decrease the volume. If you decrease the volume, here's where the volume and pressure considerations come in. When you decrease the volume, increase the pressure, that's the same thing because volume and pressure are based, they accomplish the same thing, I should say, because volume and pressure are directly proportional to one another. Um, but the idea here is, is that when you increase, uh, actually, sorry, they're not directly proportional. I'm sorry. Let me write it out. From our original idea of Boyle's Law, pressure is inversely proportional to volume. So what I just meant to say here, let me clarify before I move on, decreasing the volume is the same, accomplishes the same thing that increasing the pressure does. Inversely proportional. Sorry, I had to clarify that before I moved on because I was like, I just said that entirely wrong. All right, so one more time with feeling. Decreasing the volume, increasing the pressure, or doing the converse is going to affect the side with the largest number of moles of gas. More, ex more completely than the side with the smaller number of moles of gas. So to do volume and pressure considerations, you have to think about which side of this reaction has the largest number of moles of gas. All right, so let's see. In this particular, re <laughs> particular reaction, luckily all the reactants and products are gases, so I simply add these together. Two plus one is three moles of gas on this side, and here you can see we have two moles of gas on this side. All right, three moles of gas versus two moles of gas. When we decrease the volume or increase the pressure, you're thinking about this as if the container that you have this in is getting smaller. And when it's getting smaller, those three moles of gas are going to be, those gas molecules are going to be able to see each other a lot more frequently. And when they see each other a lot more frequently, it starts to feel like there's more of them. Okay, remember we're talking about ideal gases where they were really, these gas particles were really far apart, not seeing each other hardly at all. When you decrease the volume, it starts to feel a little bit more like the liquid phase does where they see each other a lot more frequently, and therefore it feels like it's a net increase in how many particles there are, which means on the side with the larger moles of gas, when you decrease the volume and increase the pressure, it feels like you have created a hill on the side with a larger number of moles of gas, because those particles, while well, all the particles in, of, in the gas phase are starting to see each other more frequently, the effect is felt more on the side with a larger number of moles of gas. Having said that, you've just created a hill on the reactant side. How are you going to compensate for that hill? You're going to shift to the opposite side in order to compensate for that, to flatten it out. And so when you decrease the volume or increase the pressure, both of these, like I said, accomplish the same thing, the net kind of feeling here is that you are going to shift. You created a hill on the side with a larger number of moles of gas. You're going to shift to the opposite side in order to compensate towards that. So you're going to shift this reaction to the right. Shift towards the products. OK. That is all we have time for. Until I see you next time, adieu.